Oh, check, check, check. Hello, hello. Wait, hang on. Hi. I'm going to pause, you know, Eric and I were being kind of silly. So welcome to the, um, the Goal One call. I will um, I'm gonna kick it off. I'm going to give everyone like another minute or so to join because um, cause that happens too. It, it, people start coming in a little bit later on. Um, Eric, are you scribing or is Tiffany scribing? Let's see. I'm. Uh, let's, I have not muted myself yet. So yes, I'm. So I'm planning to scribe. I actually found uh, the the place that I was worried about uh, not being at. Um, I, so I, I'm good for actually being on video and being on the whole call. And okay. so I, I've got it. Although if, if somebody else is interested in in helping out with that, that's also good. So okay. um, can you drop the agenda into the Slack so people can play along at home? Um, and yes. and as um, as we as we do on these calls, we usually want to introduce and and we record this so that people who aren't atten able to attend the call are able to join and watch and everything's shared on the eship Slack um, the the beta dashboard which um, hopefully one of you will put in here um, that would be great so thank you. Um, and thank you for joining us on the call. So we have a wonderful speaker today because I've heard her speak. Um, but, um, but before we get started, we want to know who else is on the call. So um, we usually do a popcorn question. And when we popcorn, you pick the next person who's going to speak. And, um, and our question, very apropos of this call, is tell us, share something you've read, listened to, watched um, recently that has an inclusion diversity lens um, that maybe um, more than anything else kind of um, opened yourself up to something you've never thought about or, or thought or heard before. So, um, so not the usual, this is what I, you know, what I've read or learned. So, um, so the question is, again, what is it that you've read, heard, listened to recently that, um, that opened yourself up? So I will model what's needed to create what's possible by sharing that, I, um, I read a book not too long ago called Invisible Women, uh, the data science in a world built for men, which um, really opened up my eyes um, and inspired me and annoyed me at the same time. Like I was really mad that 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 had to be a book. So um, but it's a it's a wonderful book of really useful information. And it'll take you off. So anyway, um, I'm going to popcorn to Eric. Oh, you caught me. All right. So let's see. So um, recently, uh, there's a, there's a new season for a show called Seen on Radio. Seen on Radio uh, is now in season four. Season two, they had a, a program called Seeing White, and it was sort of about just basically for, for white folks, you know, how are they looking, how are they looking at the world and sort of questioning, you know, how they evolved, bias, all sorts of different, you know, angles on, um, on that question. They've also done a show about gender. Uh, the current show, and I'm not sure if I know the title, but the current show is actually looking at the formation of the United States. So, and it's looking at some of the history and, you know, the founding fathers and some of the various issues they, that were, you know, affecting them. So it's really taking, um, it's taking a good hard look at some of the sort of foundational truths that we may not be aware of. Um, and that's so definitely, you know, race, race and ethnicity is certainly a big part of that. So, so anyway, that's, I'm, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season of just like in the episode two. I will hike it over to Katie. Okay. I'm sorry. I just, I was late. What are we oh, doing? I'm sorry. <laughs> so the questions in the chat, what have you heard, listened to, read recently related to diversity and inclusion that opened your thinking and impacted you? Sorry. <laughs> that further opened my thinking because as a, as a woman of color, I always get amused by that. So, somebody who's living it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so as a woman of color, um, so as a female, with uh, brown ancestry, 
us over 60. So I think I'm hitting three areas of diversity. Um, I, I have to say, I haven't found anything that surprises me because this is something that I've been living with since mm -hmm. the first time I, when I joined corporate America and people would come up and ask me if they could touch my hair. So, or, or, or customers would think it was okay for them to pat me on the butt when I walked out of their office. So I, I haven't, I'm not, I haven't found anything that's surprising yet. Very reasonable answer. Uh, now you get to popcorn to somebody else. And one of the reasons we do that is just kind of, it's to build the sort of the connections and all the, 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 the connectivity oh, okay. and the relationships among different folks. Then we'll go to Jose. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh -huh. Right, wonderful. So, um, and just to uh, refresh the memory of some of you. So we, you know, I work with an organization that focuses on providing a, uh, support and consulting to um, Hispanic entrepreneurs, especially immigrants who uh, are recent arrivals and, you know, they, they try to get out of poverty and uh, reach economic independence through entrepreneurship. So one thing that I read actually a while back and we have incorporated in our, in our, in what we do in our speech, in our deli message delivery is, uh, I read something of, of a previous um, chamber member a chamber president um, had something to do with uh, these immigrants who start businesses. Uh, at the end of the day, these are American businesses that create American jobs. And, you know, we have always encountered that, especially when we talk to elected officials, uh, they say, well, these are immigrants who starting businesses here in our country. And at the end of the day, it's true. I mean, these are American businesses that happen to be creating American jobs, paying American taxes. They happen to by uh, uh, immigrants, but at the end of the day, it's American American uh, businesses. So, so we that, that kind of struck me when I read that, and so, like I said, we're incorporating that more into in, in, in our in our message delivery. So, I think it was very powerful. Okay, Jose, your turn to pick somebody. All right, so I'll put it to Tiffany. Thanks, Jose. Um, so, one thing that has really shifted my thinking recently was actually after a recent phone call with Cecilia and we were talking about how some um, people that have historically been deemed as heroes might not have always made choices that live up to that type of title. So the specific example that we were discussing was Helen Keller had a preference um, and you know she believed in eugenics and that was really shocking to me um, and it kind of brought to light my own assumptions and how quickly I believe just what is told to me about a person and think oh you know I have this huge assumption that because I read a book about this person in third grade um, I, I know everything about them and that they are wonderful. And so it really caused me to step back and think about, you know, there's no real golden example of any type of person, you know, it's not fair to lift at someone up as a shining example of anything. So in Helen Keller's case is someone, you know, with a disability, um, and that I really need to consider the whole person. And also, it made me think about how there's a whole bunch of people that I've never heard of. And maybe I should <laughs> do, you know, educate myself on some incredible stories of people that aren't just given to me um, from books in school. So that conversation, Cecilia, um, really <laughs> made an impact. And I was thinking about it for a long time after that. So thanks for that. <laughs> Annika. Hi, um, this is my first time on this call, Annika Horn, based in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Um, I, I will fully admit that I wasn't going to be on this call, and then I saw that Natalie's going to be on this call, and I thought, well, I'm going to try to listen. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm super keen to learn. I am helping to lead the storytelling initiative as part of eShip, 
and uh, we are hoping to feature sort of storytelling meets goal one. There's a lot of storytelling that needs to be done. And what better way than to listen in and see what you guys are talking about, thinking about, struggling with, so that I can sort of report back to the storytelling initiative what some really interesting angles could be. Um, there's been quite a bit of DEI recently in, in my work and what I've been reading. So for one, I recently had the chance to interview Faye Horwitt for my venture called Social Venturers. And uh, Faye is a very generous, humble person and is able to talk about it and make you just uncomfortable enough, but not to the point where you want to run out the room. So I really appreciate that about her. And it's just a great way for me to learn and really put myself in her shoes. And I don't know if it's just me or if she does that with everybody. And then secondly, we are launching a campaign called the Unsung Heroes of Ecosystem Building. And we were hoping for like 10 to maybe 15, 20 nominations and ended up with over 70, 70 nominations from all across the US. And I mean, just talk about people you don't even know are out there doing amazing stuff. And it is, I'm, I'm thrilled to see what I can tell so far that it's a very diverse group. So, whoa, there's so much going on. Um, and I am going to popcorn over to Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for making some of your time for this conversation today. Um, I'm going to share a couple of things that I have uh, gotten a hold of recently that I, I think have really transformed my work um, as we get into the talk. But the one that I, I want to share right now is not even specifically around DNI, but there is an author named Trista Harris. She is an African-American philanthropy futurist, which is a fancy way of saying she's applied the methodology around futurism um, to try to get philanthropy to think bigger and more strategic. And we all know that we could use that. Um, and so she has a book called Future Good, which is a quick read and you know won't be taxing for you at night, but she talks about, I heard her speak in St. Louis in front of a group of funders two weeks ago, she talks about how so often in the nonprofit sector where we really are just trying to make things like 10% less bad instead of making like solutions 10 times more impactful. And I laughed like a little too loudly um, because it was, it just like bowled me over. Um, the way that we were approaching change or were thinking about harm reduction as opposed to you know new solutions and anyway i can't stop talking about five percent less bad um instead of ten times more impactful like if i ever have a child i'll probably name them like not five percent less bad um because i just think it's it's so critical and so that's a frame that i've been thinking a lot about um and so i'm gonna popcorn it over to antonia and uh, Antonia, I think you joined us a little bit late. So what we're doing is we're answering the question, um, what have you read or heard recently related to diversity and inclusion that opened your thinking in some way and impacted you? Awesome, thank you, Natalie. Um, yeah, apologies, I had a call that ran a little bit late. Um, I appreciate you <laughs> uh, recapping what the question is. Oh man, um, this is a very, timely one um, because I, of course, set a New Year's resolution for myself to read more. And so far, I've been uh, doing pretty well um, on on that. Um, I, but I'm trying to think of which one best to mention. Well, okay, while I ruminate on that, I will uh, share some updates, I guess, on, on the work that uh, Change Catalyst has been doing. We um, just launched um, Tech Inclusion 2020 not too long ago. Um, so Tech Inclusion is uh, the conference that uh, Change Catalyst has hosted for going on six years now, um, starting in San Francisco and uh, traveling all across the US and um, around the world uh, to bring people together to focus on solutions to uh, diversity and inclusion. So after celebrating our fifth year anniversary last year, um, the team uh, kind of got together and thought about how tech inclusion can uh, evolve um, and continue to stay relevant um, and continue to be impactful um, and really give people what, what they need um, in order to make the tech industry um, more diverse and more inclusive um, in a sustainable way. So um, 
after after you know much deliberation, um, we have decided to pivot and um, announce Tech Inclusion 2020, the next wave of tech talent. Um, and so we're going to be um, focusing a little bit more on technical content um, this year than we have in the past. But of course, diversity and inclusion is still at the center of everything that we do. Um, and our, our, our desire is to really, um, you know, help prepare uh, the next wave of tech talent that, that we believe are the people who have been um, underrepresented for so long um, to be successful and see, see the people who are currently, you know, successful and, and, and see um, how they can uh, continue on, on that path, um, follow, follow in those footsteps, um, and also forge their own ways. Um, and, uh, and, and also just learning like more technical skills and things like that as well, making it really like actionable and hands-on. So uh, we're excited. Um, it's gonna be different. Um, hope that you all um, can join us either in San Francisco or New York this year. We're gonna be in, um, in uh, both locations. So uh, happy to drop the link to the website in the chat um, after I'm, I'm done rambling um, so that everybody can check it out. Um, but, Coming back to the book question, um, you know, I read American Prison uh, not too long ago, and uh, it, I think, is related to diversity and inclusion in some, some pretty obvious ways, um, talking about, you know, some of the, the most marginalized and the most discriminated against um, populations in our, in, in the United States. Um, but the thing that I learned about it that was interesting or like kind of an unexpected learning I had was the um the way that it impacted me I think like emotionally and psychologically like as I was reading and as I was learning like um being confronted with these like horrifying realities about like uh the United States like was actually having like a very heavy impact on on my own like well-being and like wellness and mental health and stuff and I had to like take a step back and realized that and and it um reminded me the how privileged i am that i can do that and like put the book down and like take a step away for for a moment um when there are people who are who cannot do that um so i think that would be my answer to the question regarding books great thanks for that antonio that's um pretty impactful um Thanks. Malika is um, joined us, so we want to honor her presence and ask her the question that she wasn't prepared to ask um, to answer. So the question that we're popcorning, Malika, is what have you heard, listened to, read recently related to diversity and inclusion that opened up your thinking and impacted you? And I think she's the last one. I don't know if I have, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I have an answer to that question. I've been pretty underground lately. Um, I've been reading some stuff around Alice Walker and it's not really related to diversity and inclusion in the way that we we're talking about it, but it is relate. It's a lot of womanist thinking uh, writings about stories about uh, black women and who's really writing their stories. Even the stories that we think are mundane, like our mothers, our grandmothers and things like that. And it just got me thinking about how often we champion people that have really I guess done things that we consider achievements, but even in the mundane, those things are passed down to us to get us to this space where we are, like the creativity and the way that we think. And so there's value in not just the people that we feel like are the record breakers, but also the people who are just doing basic everyday parts of their lives. So it's not related to diversity and inclusion, but it is challenging my way of thinking even about kind of what my mother and grandmothers and other people are bringing to my lives and how that impacts the way I think today. So that's all. And I don't know if Thank there's, you, you say I'm I the think, last one. I think that might be, you, you oh, might be the Grace. last one. Great. Did we get somebody else? Great, Grace is here. Oh. Will you ask Grace the question, Eric, and then um, go ahead and introduce 
um, Natalie. All right, sure thing. So uh, Grace, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we've got a question for you, uh, just gone around the table. Oh, awesome. Uh, and that is, what have you heard, listened to, or read recently related to diversity and inclusion that has maybe opened your thinking and impacted you, surprised you, had some, some reaction? So I apologize for being late to this, um, but I was just meeting with Shelly Bell from Black Girl Ventures, and we were talking about how do we take a, a systems thinking approach to solving some of the problems. So rather than, you know, our organizations trying to, to overlap, we're sort of considering our organizations and what we can do in terms of meeting. How do we develop a, a pipeline or, you know, put all the pieces of the puzzle together and show potential funders and sponsors of our work how we are working together to actually create um, a pipeline for creating more inclusive and equitable um, entrepreneurial spaces. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so we are super excited today. Um, so I'll just say uh, Natalie's been kind of on, there's been a couple different folks who have helped organize these calls, you know, throughout its time. Um, and Natalie's been on, on our short list almost since the beginning. Um, so one, one of the things or a couple of the things that I, that I like about Natalie and I'll shut up really quickly <laughs> is that she's, she's served in a variety of different roles. And I think that's really, really important um, to her, her current role with, uh, with the Kaufman Foundation as a program officer. But before that, you know, a, an ecosystem builder in St. Louis, uh, a grantee. So she's, she's kind of experienced the various different ways that, uh, that we typically, that we often have around ecosystem building. And I think she brings a number of sort of different lenses to the way that, uh, that giving has happened or uh, uh, funding has happened through Kaufman. But not only that, I think she's been in a, particularly good seat to kind of see some of the some of the projects around the country that that are working in the diversity equity inclusion field so this is and I, I will say as, as a preface this isn't the, the voice of the Calvin Foundation this is her personal take on things um, and that's one of the things that I also enjoy is that when she when she is on these these different calls and you know talking about different programs etc she, she brings her full self to the work and I think that's that's really that's really awesome so really uh, happy to have Natalie here today and I will shut up and, and hand it off to you Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone, so much for your time. Um, I'm going to take you know, hopefully no more than 20 minutes to run through some highlights. And then what I really want to do is have a dialogue and a discussion. Um, and if, you know, we run out of time or you need to leave early, always happy to keep talking about these kinds of things. Um, as Eric said, my name is Natalie Self. I'm a program officer here at Kaufman. Um, I know that sometimes on the outside, it's impossible to understand, like, what we do and how we're organized. So um, the sort of quick, easy answer is in entrepreneurship, there's a variety of strategies. So ecosystems is one strategy. And then there's another strategy focused on supporting entrepreneur support organizations, really helping entrepreneurs start and grow their businesses. And that's where I sit. And I sit with Chris Harris. Um, you may know him or Aaron Jenkins or Melissa Roberts Chapman. I know some of you know her as well. Um, and I've been at the foundation for about two years. And like Eric said, was a previous grantee. And so I'll talk about that um, a little bit today. What I think we agreed that I was gonna talk about was sort of my personal learnings from Inclusion Open um, and from the landscape of organizations that we see, the projects that we funded, some of the lessons that we have from those about if you really care about inclusion and equity, at an ecosystem builder level, what are some things to think about? And so um, again, like Eric said, you know, hashtag tweets are my own. Um, this is not sort of official Kaufman policy, right? Or directives and, and all that good stuff. Um, I am happy to provide some additional information at the end. You know, I've done some writing. Um, I'm fairly vocal on Twitter. Um, if you don't already follow me, I'm often writing tweets and thinking, is this the tweet that's gonna get me fired? Or is this the tweet that's gonna get me fired? Um, and so also you can find me there at, at Natalie M. Self if you want to. So a little bit of background on what is inclusion open. 
Um, so starting in 2016, the Kauffman Foundation ran a national request for proposals for um, entrepreneur support organizations that care about creating more equitable opportunities for entrepreneurship across the United States. Um, some of you on the call are very familiar with it, um, but for those who weren't, um, Chris Harris started it in 16, he did one in 17, and then we did one in 19 before the foundation decided to sunset the strategy um, at the end of last year. Um, typically, again, these organizations are entrepreneur support organizations. So some of them do ecosystem building and do direct entrepreneur support. Some of them just do direct entrepreneur supports. Um, you have Shelly Bell was mentioned. She was a 2019 winner. Um, Jose and Prospera were, if you are interested in the full list of grantees, you can find them on our website at k.org backslash entrepreneurship under the market gaps little tab, or I can just send you the list. Um, in the time that we did the strategy, we funded about 15 organizations in 2015 Puerto Rico. Um, since 2015, they've served over 12,242 entrepreneurs. Um, and because we care about business starts and growth in our strategy, it's worth noting that 69% of entrepreneurs that were served through their businesses um, and their revenue. And while not every entrepreneur needs or wants to raise capital, 31% of those did. Again, the vast majority of those folks were women, people of color, rural folks, immigrants, um, or folks that are in the community that we you know, might be underrepresented or under-resourced. I'm pretty intentional about saying individuals from communities systemically left behind. Whatever you want to underestimate it, whatever you want to call that group, those are really the folks that we care about. Um, so in 2016, I received an Inclusion Open Award um, in St. Louis to launch and fund the St. Louis Equity and Entrepreneurship Collective. It is a collective of organizations still running today whose mission it is to increase race and gender equity in the ecosystem of organizations in St. Louis that support early stage tech-based entrepreneurs. So brevity is not something I'm good at, but specificity is. So um, that is the work of that organization. I'm happy to talk about that if that is of interest to you. Um, if you are interested in that, you can just Google that as well. So what I want to do is, you know, wearing that hat, wearing the funding hat, just kind of give five trends that I see that I think you all probably already know, um, but maybe I can say succinctly um, because I'm not, I have the luxury of not being in the work every day. Um, but before I do that, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank you for your work. I wanna thank you for your effort. I know how difficult it can be sometimes. I know how thrilling it can be sometimes. Um, but honestly, you know, your, yours is the work that I am most excited about hearing about. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump in. And in no particular order, here's sort of five things that are on my brain. Um, I debated about whether to put this one first or last, but first is that national philanthropy won't save us and neither will national organizations. And so you know you work in place and you work in space. Um, and one of the things that I really care about and we really need to pay attention to is how we are leveraging the storytelling work that is being done or the other work that's happening in the other goal areas to increase funders and investors understanding about the importance of ecosystem building. So in 2019 for Inclusion Open, we received 777 applications. Um, we made like, I don't know, 18, 17 grants. And of those, I read every single one of them. And of those, I would say, 450 to 500 were just really solid local programs, right? Like really good ecosystem building programs that happens, you know, Wheaton, Illinois wants to have a co-working space with childcare or, you know, someplace in Colorado wants to do a startup and like stuff that you and I know is critical to the work, particularly if we're going to bring um, women and people of color and rural folks into entrepreneurship. Um, and as a funder, um, as a national funder, I, I can't fund those programs, right? But in the absence of local foundations understanding the work, you folks turn to the same place that I turned to, right, when I um, was a grantee. And so being clear with ourselves and each other 
that we have what we need in our communities um, and we cannot look to the Kauffman Foundation or others to, um, to, to save us. We cannot hitch our star to that ride. Um, foundations for better or worse change strategy and there is a change in the funding landscape nationally around this work. Happy to talk more about that later. Um, so the great news though is that we know a lot about what works in place and um, again, this is just my opinion, but I, I feel fairly strongly about it. Um, when you are building a program or initiative, it is critical that we are clear about our theory of change. One of the things, because we are ecosystem builders and because we care about democracy and we care about everyone in, in our community and we want everyone to succeed, I, the, the number one, I don't want to say mistake, but I think the number one challenge that I see that organizations do is they try to be everything to all people. And in the process, we're not able to make real clear strategic decisions about how we're allocating resources, about how we're measuring success, about the story that we're telling. And if we can't do, do those three things, we can't raise money, right? And if we can't raise money, when well, we can't do the work. And so there's a tension and, and you know, Grace talked about this. Um, and I, I think this is, this is interesting with Shelly is like in the space that you're at or the, the people that you are working with and you care about, I actually don't think that it is prudent to say that I'm going to serve all of the people, right? Unless you have money to serve all of the people. Um, but what are those partnerships and those pipelines and those warm and strong handoffs that you can create between organizations? I think that's really important. Now there are some places that um, for reasons that include a willingness on the part of civic leaders to pool funds and really in a dearth of support. They have funded one stop like ecosystem building shops. So you know, kind of think about Commons on Champa, right? Or maybe um, in Memphis Epicenter. Um, but the reality is that those are, those are odd and those are one-offs and that doesn't happen very frequently. So be clear about what you're doing and why and for whom. I don't know that I particularly care um, if people do an entrepreneurship program or ecosystem building because they want to democratize access versus you really want to help people take a small business and grow it versus they really want to create jobs for their community. All of those are good things, but you need different talent and you need different funding and you need different programs depending on what you're trying to do. Does that make sense? Um, so three. This is more sort of in the weeds about supporting um, entrepreneurs from communities systemically left behind, but it's worth saying. I think there's often a disconnect between um, you know, the folks on the ground and, and the folks that I imagine that you would want to work with in your ecosystem building fellowships um, who have the trusted relationships with people who aren't often engaged in the traditional entrepreneurship. And then the gatekeepers are the folks who have access to resources. So just put plainly, right, there has been a surge, um, which we have seen nationally and has probably long existed and we're just behind because we're in a foundation. Um, but there are surges of, you know, I think about like Shelly Bell or I think about the mortar guys or like black folks who just really care about community and have really great relationships with community and are they themselves entrepreneurs and see that they didn't get the support that they wanted when they were starting their businesses. And so they start entrepreneur support organizations and that's great. One of the mistakes I think I made when I was doing that was I didn't ever really talk to the small business banker who actually was going to give my entrepreneur money and resources. And so when we put them through a curriculum, they came out empowered and feeling confident about themselves as people who are business owners. But our curriculum candidly wasn't as rigorous as it would have, as it probably should have been in order to set them up for success in the market that we have. Um, and so that's a little I think that's a little bit of a controversial opinion or not one that we talk about a lot, but when I think about the best programs, I think about the programs, you know, I'll, again, I'll talk about Epicenter, like they're clear that one of their theories of change for the 800 initiative, they're like, we are going to find 800 black owned businesses in Memphis. They are going to already exist. We are going to give them 
you know, what would have been friends and, and friends and family money in order to get to a first customer. And we are going to make sure that we, that the first customer tells us what those folks need to be able to demonstrate in order to get that contract, right? Like it's, it is that connection to the end gatekeeper um, that ensures that the entrepreneur is successful when they have gone through the program. I think this is, this leads me to point four, which I think is a challenge. And that is that we have to constantly balance teaching the fish how to exist in the groundwater and changing the groundwater. And so the metaphor here is, um, you know, REI, the Race Equity Institute talks about how so many of our social service programs are just sort of putting a bandaid on or they're teaching people how to survive in a racist, sexist, classist environment, right? And they really push you to think about what are you doing to change the groundwater that the fish swim in? And I think you have to, I think we have to do both. In the short term, we have to equip our entrepreneurs with skills to exist in the dirty, gross, racist groundwater. And we have to do the work to change that groundwater. And that looks like for me, um, and in St. Louis, you know, bias training for investors, incenting behavior in different ways. You know, Goldman Sachs recently said, we're not gonna take a company public if you don't have one woman on your board. Folks, it's 2020. That seems like that should be obvious. And there were some folks who said, well, that's, you know, we shouldn't be praising people for just having one woman on their board or whatever. But Goldman Sachs is what like board members listen to and care about, right? And so that effort is, is around changing groundwater but also we need to continue to help our folks understand how to exist in that groundwater. And then finally, and then I'll stop because um, I'm curious about you know, what you're seeing, what you think, or if you think I'm totally wrong, which is also totally fine. Um, how we do our work is just as important as the work that we do. And this is a tool that um, I wanna talk about that I will send a link to it's called a white dominant culture and something different, a worksheet. And so essentially what it does is it lays out for us what our sort of cultural norms are on this side that like candidly are rooted in white supremacy and how to do the work differently. And it has crystallized for me the way that we can try to do really good things, but if we're doing them in a way that continues to oppress people, then we're not really changing the narrative. And so here's a couple of examples. Um, you know, power hoarding versus that's sort of the norm or the dominant culture versus power sharing. Um, and I don't know about you, but in St. Louis where there's a scarcity of resources, I hear a lot of frustrated and underpaid and undersupported ecosystem builders and ESO leaders, you know, have the meeting in the parking lot, right, after the meeting, where they say, well, I, that person doesn't really do that work, right, like, we're actually the ones that are supporting women and people of color, we're actually doing that, right, and it's that sort of behavior that is, doesn't come from abundance, that comes from competition, that comes from hoarding resources and information, that is not only just sort of not helpful to the work, but candidly, I think for me, and I, you know, I will be honest and transparent in the vein of doing something different, um, that sort of behavior has stolen my joy. And it, it has burned me out. And it has burned me out at the foundation and it burned me out in St. Louis. And so if we can practice things that you all are already practicing, but continuing to do it in our community, like collaboration, like leadership representative of those with the, you know, affected by the inequity, like collectivism, like learning how to have difficult conversations and giving direct feedback as opposed to talking behind people's back, right? Like um, investing in transformational relationships as opposed to transactional relationships. I think that we, we might create an even more different reality than the one that we're in right now. So my five again, and then I'll stop. 
is um, national philanthropy isn't going to save us. So let's okay. Let's sit in our abundance of our own communities, right? Two, be clear of when you're building a program or initiative about why you're doing it. Be very specific about that narrow theory of change. And consequently, build intentional partnerships and handoffs. Three, make sure that those who are putting sorry, together... Uh, number two sounded like two things. Um, so it's, two be things. clear about your theory of change is like the headline. Okay. But to what Grace was saying, make sure then you understand what the handoff is going to be, right? Or the partnership that is that you're going to need for your entrepreneurs. Three is make sure that you understand what gatekeepers are looking for when they evaluate entrepreneurs and incorporate that in curriculum. Four is balancing teaching the fish how to swim in the groundwater and changing the groundwater. And then five, being intentional about how you work. You know, how you do the work is just as important as what you do. Thoughts, arguments, curiosities, disagreements, everything is welcome. So it sounded like a combination of trends and tips. There, yes. Okay. Things that, things that I, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Natalie, are there any um, initiatives, programs, individuals who you think do a really good job at one or several of those five? Does someone come to mind as sort of a, a good practice at least, if not a best practice? So I'm always wary to highlight people because I have a disproportionate, I think we subconsciously give me a disproportionate amount of power on this. So that being said, um, I mentioned, well, let me go down the list. So for the first one, so much of this is variable based on your community, but there was a, there was a project proposed at the last ESHIP summit that was how do we talk to community foundations about ecosystem building? And I don't remember what goal it's in and I have no idea what's happening with it, but if I had free time, that's the one I would work on. So, goal you know, six. Come join us on a goal six call. Goal six, there you go. Um, I, you know, I think that that is a potentially a promising practice. Um, two, you know, that narrow theory of change, I could highlight a lot, but the one that I highlighted excuse me, was Epicenter Memphis and their 800 initiative. They're very narrowly focused on growing black businesses. And that program has a tiny, very narrow theory of change. You have to be a black owned business in one of the three predominant sectors in Memphis that already exists, that has a certain amount of revenue, that needs a cash investment of under $5,000 or something. I don't remember exactly what it is in order to get you to a next customer, right? But because it's so narrow, they're really good at that one piece of the puzzle. You know, I, I could talk about um, Propeller in New Orleans. I mean, I could talk about any number of programs there. Three, um, the, the connection to the gatekeepers. I think Cincinnati Minority Business Accelerator is good at this. They recognize that, again, their sweet spot is businesses of color that are looking to be suppliers for large institutions in town. And they know because of their experience, because they hired former bankers, right? They know what bankers care about. So when you come out of that program, your financials look like what the banker wants you wants to see. Balancing teaching the fish how to be in the groundwater and fixing the groundwater. Um, you know, I think Propeller is doing a little bit of this in New Orleans. Um, I think the Equity and Entrepreneurship Collective in St. Louis is doing a little bit of the groundwater work. There's, pro there's probably others. And then how you do, do the work is as important as what you do. Um, 
as Shelly Bell has talked a little bit about this, Joyful Ventures. Um, we, I have a grantee out of California called Elemental Accelerator. And their grant is to basically put together a playbook for how to not only help entrepreneur support organizations work more equitably, but how to build equitable practices into tech companies early on, right? That like when you graduate from the accelerator, not only do you have a lean business canvas and a pitch and a pitch deck, but you are required to have equitable practices in there. Um, and that I, that is new. That's a hypothesis that we took a, candidly we're kind of making a bet on um, and they're you know, four months into it or whatever. Um, so that one's new, but Sarah Chandler at, at, at um, Elemental Accelerator is, is working on that. Are there other examples that folks have seen of these five? There's a whole list of 80 NRPs, um, some of whom address that. Actually, um, I have a different question for you, Natalie. Mm -hmm. We talked about underrepresented demographics, and you and I had a conversation um, about the the things that you didn't see applying for the inclusion grant, or that you see um, um, too few of, or or so few of. So I think one of the things that we address is mental health. So out of seven hundred and seventy five applications, um, you got like an unth of. Um, so, so how do we engage or how do we recognize or how do we even know what's underrepresented? Because there's already major groups that are underrepresented, but um, those underrepresented groups are coming up. So conversation I had with Andy a while back was, you know, he said it's still, there's the numbers for women and, and black entrepreneurs or people of color are way down. And I said, those are those are metrics that we that are shared there are a whole bunch of metrics that we don't share right so people with mental disabilities or, or mental challenges are something that that's not shared as widely not measured as as much so we don't know but I know Arnobio um, from Startup Genome that's something that he had wanted to measure was how many um, entrepreneurs uh, have recognized um, mental health disorders, mm -hmm. right? It's and a there's a incidentally, like depression and isolation. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But so also it, OCD and, and ADHD, um, ADHD is huge among entrepreneurs because they don't fit in the typical box of work. Um, so they end oh, up becoming dyslexia. entrepreneurs. Yeah, dyslexia. Mm -hmm you know, stuff like that. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I, so I don't know that I have a concrete answer. I think this is, this is though the beauty of being place-based because the spectra of who is an entrepreneur, right, is everyone from our storefront churches to our ADHD stereotype, like tech person in a dorm room to Natalie who likes to keep busy and likes to go on vacation. And so she has a consulting business on the side, right? And and does work not inside the Kauffman Foundation. And so I do think that it's important to understand that you have to meet people where they're at, both literally and emotionally and physically and metaphorically. And that's why when we think about quality programs, and you know this, like having the voice of the person that you are trying to serve or the people that you're trying to serve at the center of that is critical. And, you know, I cannot say this because my legal department isn't sure that they can defend it in court. But if I see a program that is targeted for a specific type of person, slice and dice how you want, race, color, lived experience, educational attainment, type of company, I, like and the leadership and the staff and the board don't also have that lived experience. Like I have, a, I have a lot of questions about, you know, how do you know? How do you build trust? How do you connect? Now, it's not always possible, right? Um, and and it doesn't mean that it has to be a one for one match. But you know, this is a human game. This is a person to person work, right? And everything moves at the speed of trust. And so, regardless of what 
the category of underrepresented is, um, I think it's important to make sure that you're intentional about who you're serving and that those who are serving are reflective of that experience. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I have what might be, I'm not sure if it's a useful question, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. <laughs> there are <laughs> no is, bad questions. Well, I'll try. <laughs> I mean, it's, so I'm wondering, is there, is there anything that's just been like really out of the box or very surprising that was also well done that you saw that just, I mean, a, a lot of things are it's just like, it seems like the meat and potatoes and they get it right. And that's really, really good. I'm wondering if there's anything kind of left field that also provided real value. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, I'm trying to... I'm trying to think of um, examples. You know, I think those who would be an example for this are those, again, who center the folks they're trying to serve and they're rigorously curious about it. Um, and, you know, are they are themselves entrepreneurial, right? So we had a grant to City Startup Labs in North Carolina. South Carolina, one of the Carolinas. Um, and their original grant was supporting millennials of color, um, you know, run by people of color. Um, and they got into the program and in part, you know, between the time that they applied and they got the grant, the, the landscape had changed a little bit in the city, I think in part because of personalities, that they decided that that wasn't a fit. But what is clear to them is that they have a number of returning citizens in their community that are coming back that deserve the opportunity to have choice about how they're going to make money for their communities and how they're going to contribute what they want to do. And so they didn't, they did a pilot program, you know, with folks that are coming home from prison and they realized like a lot of folks that are doing you know, entrepreneurship in that space, that just teaching business skills isn't often enough. And so they went through and they now have this rigorous model where they're doing workforce training and they are giving people the option to do entrepreneurship along a variety of like lanes, either solopreneur, an entrepreneur at a company, or if someone really wants to grow a scalable tech-based business. Um, and it is intentionally designed to funnel them into the ecosystem of corporations and customers in their city. Um, and they're going to try it out. Like I don't, they had a pilot that seemingly went really well and there's a partnership between the workforce board and um, they're located in communities. So the social services are wrapping around and they understand the entrepreneurship piece. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see how that goes. Um, there's a program out of Minneapolis, but in partnership with Kaufman and in partnership with the Kellogg Foundation has expanded to eight other cities. It's called Neighborhood Development Partnership. They really care about entrepreneurship as a tool to fight off gentrification in their communities, um, particularly entrepreneurship with immigrant communities and communities of color. And they are clear that the best partners for their entrepreneurs are the folks that are already in the neighborhoods. They're, they might be the organizations that are doing the resettling, or they might be the churches. They're not necessarily the business serving organizations. And what they've been able to do is they've been able to figure out, you know, we can scale the business training for you. What we can't scale are those trusted relationships. Um, and then they bring in, you know, financing and micro lending on the back end. And so it's those sorts of like constantly testing and trying things um, that that I think make the the best programs. We uh, we unfortunately, I would love to listen much, much longer. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, we have to wrap. Um, but thank you. Really, really appreciate your, your time. Um, pr pretty accessible. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm very accessible. So I will put in the chat here my email, and then um, if you're on the Twitter, um, you know. Actually, we um, when I emailed out the uh -huh. the agenda today, I put your Kaufman email address. Okay. On. Okay. All right. So well, um, that's my Twitter handle as well at Natalie himself. Um, easily accessible. Always happy to to chat. Um, I don't have 
any of the answers, um, but the thing that philanthropy gives you is a luxury of perspective and scope of vision. And so I'm happy to share any, any thoughts if that's helpful. Um, I will also share this inventory of white dominant behavior um, versus others, and then you can take a look at that as well. Great. Um, if there's a link to it, then we'll put it into the agenda so okay. that we have it and, um, and then people can reference this recording on the dashboard. So thank you. Um, Eric, anything else? Tiffany? No, nothing else from me. I'm just really thankful. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, great. Thanks, Katie. I think, okay. Great. Malika, it's good to see you on the call. And Grace, um, who, just real quick, who is the 907 phone number? Hi, it's Erin Baca from Anchorage. Oh, hi, Erin. Okay, we're like, hi. we didn't know who that was, so we wanted to make sure that your attendance was taken. <laughs> yeah, I just saw it on Facebook and was like, oh, well, I'll pop in. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again, and um, we'll wrap up and see you next month. Take okay. care. Bye, everyone. Have a Thanks good day. Thanks again very much. Thank you.